that's better. We uh, we haven't covered this before, yeah. or have we? Yeah. I just wasn't sure if I was going to review it or teach it. Yeah, no worries. So the uh, the idea is um, if with no other background of study, if you only read what's bold faced, which I guess is on everybody's version, you know the the bullet points, if you will. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> it's the uh, the Tufty list. Um, if you only read that, don't know me, haven't practiced first day in any kind of class, this can support your understanding of doing any practice. Um, you can see I've written a little bit before and after that to kind of give it a little um, salutary hello and a little contextualization, <clears throat> but I think ultimately it's not um, important. As I say in this, I've taught this many times without even um, talking about it first. <clears throat> so um, it's titled Your Practice Contextualized. And of course, I don't say here what the practice is. For us tonight, it's probably meditation. We're sat here to meditate. Somebody else could be doing Tai Chi Chuan or, you know, sweeping their deck or um, biking for an hour or whatever it is. So step one is see to your discomforts. <clears throat> when we consider that we're humans and we're now paying attention to ourselves, um, the list of discomforts is um, long, <laughs> perhaps infinite. And it's always going to be long. Right? It's not unlike if you spend the day cleaning your house. A lot got done. That feels nice to have that. It's not like your house is done. <laughs> If you had more time, I really could have gotten into the attic and I could have pulled that out and gotten behind it and repainted that or there's always more to do. So no matter how much you've done, you kind of have a long list ahead of you or even infinite. If you peck away at the infinite, you remain with the infinite, but you don't remain without accomplishment. You just remain with the infinite. And so when we say see to your discomforts, we're not trying to tackle the whole of an infinite list. We're not trying to make a long list markedly shorter. We're try not trying to work until the list is but a few things or one thing. I'm seeing to the list. I'm seeing to my discomforts. And they're my discomforts. They're not your discomforts. They're not objective discomforts. They're not discomforts that may be shared by everybody or most people or all those here, they're my discomforts. It's what's keeping me from being comfortable. And when I look at that list, <clears throat> the most discomforting thing is gonna be at the top of the list, the head of the list. So it's triage. That's what I'm seeing too. So if the most uncomfortable thing to me right now in this moment is this weird lumpy pillow, 
right? And yeah, I've, I've addressed that. And that was the number one, for me, most uncomfortable thing. When I review the list, there will be something in the number one position, something else, because that's how lists work. But the idea of our practice is not to spend the day cleaning the house, is to triage and treat the most pressing, urgent, discomforting item. And then whatever takes over that position, I can know and even say to that new number one thing that a moment ago when I checked you were not number one. So even though you're pleading with me to tend to you, I know that you weren't the number one thing when I last checked. And I did tend to the number one thing and I sorted it out. So even though you're pleading with me to take care of you, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to practice. Because I can't just tend to discomforts because they're infinite. Like if I'm cleaning the house, at some point I have to say, I gotta stop and eat, I gotta stop and rest, or I wanna just stop and enjoy my house now. It's not just clean until you have no fingers left because there's always something more to clean. So I have to recognize that however squeaky that wheel is, the truth is that it wasn't squeaky enough for me to have addressed when I went to address my discomforts. So we can cry and plead and frown and um, throw a fit that I'm not tending to it. But I know that I did tend to the most important thing. And now I'm doing something else. That's why I'm here. Now I say see to your discomforts. And the discomforts can be physical, like that's what I just did, my lumpy pillow. And my discomforts um, might be emotional or psychological or mental, and I can see to the number one thing in each of those kind of categories. And I can say, look, of all my categories, psychological, emotional, mental, physical, the most discomforting thing on all of those lists is X. I'll tend to that. I can look at it that way. And I can also say, well, I've taken care of the physical thing, the lumpy pillow, but also, um, uh, like tonight's election night. So I'm like, I'm really anxious about the results of the election. Let me tend to that. The way I might tend to that is like, hey, I can't really know the answer now. That's in fact why I'm meditating. So as much as you're asking me for your attention, you're not a thing I can address now. So the way I am going to address it is by spending some time meditating and settling you down because you're a poverty of information. So there can be no resolution. So thanks for calling me to your attention, but um, you're resolved for now. So in that case, it's kind of temporarily dissolved. Do you need to tend to the whatever keeps beeping? Sounds like a phone in a bag or something, but I don't know if it's something you have to deal with or not. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like that. Oh. Yeah, I can't see what it is, but I'll just ignore it if you guys can. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe I set mine down, but I don't know where my phone is. Yeah, my phone's over there, so Yeah. Yeah. If you're good, we'll leave it, yeah. Um, next is C to my comforts. And so now I've seen to my discomforts or discomfort, and I've tended to that. And now I'm ready to practice. 
But you know, it, it would be nice to have like one more sip of tea. I don't need to, like I, I would be fine. But of all the possible things, I think I'll prefer to have had wet my mouth for a moment and had that taste. Or maybe I don't need to, but I think I'd probably like to adjust my neck and the scarf a little bit. Like, I don't need that. But it's really nice to ask my system what it would like. Not what it needs, but just make it a little bit better. If I just added this little bit of cushion or twisted this or lowered the shades or whatever it might be, do that thing. So that I'm not trying to be in my practice thinking, I would have liked to have done this a little bit, adjusted that, tended to this, fixed that, changed that. <clears throat> so very often when people go to sit in meditation, they end up with this, that's good enough, I'll be fine. Like I'm sat, I'm on a cushion. But then the reality is they're not quite comfortable they're a little bit um, um, sort of trapped. So for example, I have all these books in front of me and I don't need them not to be there because my legs are folded. But I also know on occasion after a little while, I like to stretch my leg when I'm meditating and I'd rather not have the books there for that. Or perhaps, you know, when I stretch my leg out, now I'm going to have a cold foot because there's no blanket there. So really, I should have put an extra blanket there when I started so that I have that freedom. Do I need to do it? No, I could be fine not doing that at all. But if the thing that would add to my comfort would have been to have a little bit more blanket, a little bit less, more cushioning and warmth, tend to that. But often we don't tend to it because we say, it's not really a need. And it's I'll be fine meditating for a few minutes. And I'm sure you would be. But it's really nice to actually give yourself the time and get up and get another cushion or add another blanket. Like I like to have one kind of a little bit under my knee because the weight on my toe doesn't feel nice. And I could meditate this way. It's fine. But if I can, I like to add just like a tiny bit, just a towel or something. That makes a big difference to me. And then as I proceed, if other things come into mind that say, hey, you know what else you'd like? Go inside and brew another pot of tea and get your very favorite pillow. I can say, you guys weren't at the head of the list when I checked. Of course, that would be nice. It would also be nice if I flew to Nepal and did this meditation. But that's going on this endless list. I checked in to what I was willing to do. And I didn't suffer under this kind of um, like a severe guise of I can do it. I don't need to change anything. I can get through this. I want to be at some level of comfort. And I want to know that I gave myself a chance to foresee something I might like. I might like to have had a sip before I started by the time I'm five minutes in. So step one, see to your discomforts. Step two, see to your comforts. It seems like step two is the easy step, but often people find it very difficult to do step two because it's not need and they don't want to put them first, right? Particularly people that are very like caregiver personalities. They really can't find their way to get an extra cushion. And they're right. They could do the meditation without the extra cushion, but man, they would appreciate it, you know? And so, allowing yourself at that moment to get up again and go get your scarf, you know, or if it's going to bother me that this whole thing is twisted a little, let me get up and adjust it. I didn't need to, but it feels good for me to do that. That was my comfort. So for many people, that's really about permission. 
or valuing the urges of the self. All of these allow me to be present in the practice when I get to that stage, because I, I listened, I asked, and I addressed, right? I asked, I listened, I addressed, I made changes. And again, my comforts might have been emotional or physical or psychological or mental, right? So if I'm like, if I don't, you know, like the phone was buzzing, if I don't check the phone, you know, that's going to be my discomfort. Or I just remembered um, I want to tell so-and-so that lunch okay is good. And I, I might forget later. If that's going to be your comfort, like take a moment and like text them and let them know. It's easy to say, oh, who's going to sit there and meditate and then do a text? That's not how we meditate. That's fair, I guess. But I'm purposely trying to tend to that comfort. I'd feel a little bit better if I do this thing now that I remember it. That's going to help me have a better practice. And I know why I'm doing it. I also know why you're making fun of me about texting while I'm meditating. Or Fine, you have your experience. I'm consciously applying myself to my practice. So step three, this is really at the root of the practice. Become comfortable with any and all remaining discomforts. Doesn't mean state a preference for them. Doesn't mean love them. Doesn't mean wish to have had them. Doesn't mean don't make a plan to get rid of them down the road. But it means to become comfortable with the remaining discomforts. I, there's a permanent list of discomforts. I'm a human being. And I know I tended to the front of the line. And I know that right now what I'm doing is something else. I'm doing a healthful, valuable, purposeful practice. So I want to be comfortable that things remain that are uncomfortable, painful, suffering, whatever. I can't solve them all now. And to the extent that I'll solve or address any of them, I'm going to be better at that following a good practice than if I don't get a good practice in. So the, the path to addressing those successfully is going to be the practice that I'm trying to get to anyway. So become comfortable with any and all remaining discomforts. Doesn't mean that you wish them existed. Doesn't mean you invited them. Doesn't mean you love them. Doesn't mean that you don't have plans to resolve them. But right now, I resolve the most pressing one. Further, I addressed the most, let's say, pressing comfort wish, right? I, I did that too. And now, even though there's this whole world of things that are not comfortable, I still have this jealousy, I still have that pain, I still have that memory of my brother when we were growing up that's now in my head because we had that conversation. Maybe I'll address those as time goes on, but I need to be comfortable that these discomforts are around me, within me, a part of me, um, in my field of awareness, whatever. It doesn't mean ignore them. Doesn't mean they're pretend, it doesn't mean pretend they're other than what they are. It actually means what it says, become comfortable with the remaining discomforts. Doesn't mean that they're family or that you love them or that you want them here or wish them here or invited them here. It means to be comfortable with that which is uncomfortable. And that step three is like a lifetime of practice. Step four says practice. That's it. Just practice. 
we can presume here that it's some kind of healthful practice, right? Exercise, cooking a healthy meal, doing your meditation, doing Qigong, great. So just do that. Step four, second most difficult part in the list. Welcome back the discomforts. <clears throat> it doesn't mean notice that they're back or notice that they're still there. It doesn't mean invite them back. It doesn't mean hope they come back or cajole them back or drive them back or lure them back. It means welcome them back. It means they're here, they're coming in, <laughs> right? They're coming back to settle in your being, in your field. So the, the verb here is welcome. It's something coming into the home that is you. It's your, it's your crazy cousin, Fred, who definitely nobody invited to this Thanksgiving dinner, but here he is. Did you? We talked about it. You're not going to. Did you? No. Who would? I don't even talk to him anymore. All fine. But here he is. Are you really going to lock your door and turn the lights out and everybody be quiet? No. You open the door. Hey, Fred. Glad you made it. We made your ham and potatoes. This year and it. Like, how's everything going? Now, when you hear that story, you hear the false, hey, Fred, how are you doing that you would put on because you have to. But that's not what this practice is. The practice is welcome. The practice is not faux welcome, false welcome. It's not ruse. It's not mask. It's not lie. It's welcome. This is why this is probably the second most difficult part of this list. It's to sincerely welcome into you, your space, your field, your being, your body, your home, that which you do not want, <laughs> you did not invite, you maybe don't love, but it's here. It's satisfying and easy and even like self energizing to um, uh, dissuade that which you find discom discomforting from entering, to wall them off, to shut them out, to shout them down, to pull the welcome out away, right? Lock the door. There's like a sense of empowerment there and a, an expression of your emotion, but there's not a um, a communion there. Yeah, there's not a relationship there. So when I teach this, I teach about Pashtun Wali, the um, code of, I don't know, neighborliness, or that's probably not quite the right word. Uh, but it's like a code of uh, hospitality which is that when the unwanted comes to your door or the wanted or the stranger or the anything comes to your door, you open your door, you invite it in, you offer it your best, whether that's your best food, your best whatever drinks, the best seat, the best stories, the best tea, you know, like, right? So just hospitality. Not how little hospitality can I perform to seem to suffice. I did bring him in. I gave him a glass of water and some old lemonade. And like, I chatted him. Like, like yeah, you kind of did a routine. You performed hospitality. But you weren't really inviting them in. You weren't really welcoming them. And the Pashtun Valley is, even if this is an enemy, if they're at my door asking to come in, I invite them in, I welcome them, 
and I offer them my best, which here I'm describing as like food or story or interaction, but whatever that might be. And when your family comes to your home, that's an easy practice. Come on in. Hey, like I made your favorite thing. And you might even like eat rice and beans for a few days because you spent a bunch on getting the thing that your family wants and you cook it for your son, you know, like, and that you want to do that. Like, don't worry, we'll just eat leftovers for a few days, but we made this great meal for our kid, right? Like that's, and then you tell him your best stories and you, he sits in his favorite seat. Like, you know, that's pretty easy. A little bit harder when somebody comes over that maybe you're like friendly with, but you didn't exactly invite them. And they're, I'm not even sure why they're here, but you manage. It's not terribly hard. It's just inconvenient. Jim, did you, did you ask him? How are they? Well, it's fine. We like them. They're going to. But then imagine your enemy comes over, like just in need, you know, like how, how hard would that be to let them in at all, much less let them in in actually the same way that you would invite your family in, offer them your best. I mean, again, a lifetime of practice. And I'm not saying like, because I happen to be talking to you, teaching this, I'm not saying like, I know you guys can't do this. I get to teach it because I do this. That's not, I mean, that's a hard thing to do. And it's probably not a binary. Hey, I read this. I nodded my head. I'm going to do it now. It's probably not binary. It's probably incremental. Like, how do I get there? But that Pashtun Bali code is being a code. It's pure, right? Like, as you understand it, as it's written, it's perfect and simple, but it's not easy to live. But the practice is I've done my practice. The, the overall practice here is I've done step four. I've done my practice at the end of my practice. I'm at the threshold of the mundane again, right? I'm coming back into the old regular world. Like I had my 10 minutes to meditate. Now I have to deal with all the craziness in the world here come my discomforts, right? They're right. They're, they're the dwarves at the door in the, uh, the Lord of the Rings, right? There's, there's more of them. They're still at the door. And if I can actually practice to welcome them back, cause they're coming back. I never have finished a practice and just said there I'm enlightened. Like that hasn't happened yet. As soon as I'm done, I'm back to worrying about how I'm going to pay my taxes and eat dinner and whatever, you know, just the concerns of the day are. Here they come. And it's a whole litany of things that are uncomfortable. And it's only when I can welcome them back that I have an at a reasonable opportunity to do the last step, step six, which is return to the mundane world to do that successfully and having been affected healthfully from your practice in step four. If I've actually welcomed back the discomforts. So this is why I say when we sat down to meditate, like take an extra blanket, take an extra minute, right? If you really want that pillow, take a moment, get up and get it or ask for it. Or, or if you'd rather unbuckle your belt, take a second and do that. Or if you want to have a sip, get it. If you want your reading glasses, don't fight to like take a moment, get them. If that resolves that comfort, that discomfort. But notice when you go to do your practice, how readily you dismiss um, facing the discomforts and dismiss the value of tending to a comfort. How readily we kind of in a Spartan way just say, oh, I can do it. I don't, I don't need that. Or I'm not worth it. Or it's fine. I've done this. Be I don't take a moment and fix your shoelace if that's the thing. And you'll see me do that when I practice. I'll very often say, okay, we're all ready. And I'll stand there to start. But then I'll adjust something that doesn't really need adjusting. I could get through it or I'll appear to begin to start, but then I'll walk over and have a sip of my tea or something like that. 
or I'll about to start and then I'll say, you know what, let me go put my phone down or I'll make this. And it might seem to you like the rhythm is like, I'm walking over. I took a breath. We're, oh, okay. Steve needs to tuck his shirt in or, or whatever. And I don't need to, but I'm valuing that recognition of this is going to bother me. Maybe a tiny bit, but for me, it's right there in my face. And then on the other hand, I, I could do with another sip. For me, it's often having a sip, but whatever the comfort is. And so I'll do that. And like, I'm trying to honor my approach to the practice and my approach to the world I find after practice. And so if you can learn these, memorize them, study them, whatever, doing this with every practice is its own meta practice. And you can kind of get involved and say, see to your discomforts. And I see five facets of the self, so I'll take time to do each one, spiritual, mental, physical, whatever, all the facets for the, I could, sort of make it involved if I want. And I could just say, you know, which one comes up from whatever category I'll tend to that and move on. So often the whole thing takes me another, all the parts, like 20 seconds. And then, you know, step four, the practice takes the time it takes. So it's not really noticeable to anybody, but I'm on ramping and off ramping from the practice. You guys want to take a moment to see to your discomfort and we'll meditate for a couple minutes. Read the, read the, it sounds like you don't have questions, right? So, okay.